Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I often talk about the athletic capacity of the fish that I study and how their performance might be affected by climate change and other anthropogenic stressors. Just like in human athletes, our lung function is really important to our performance. In fish athletes, or fish in general, their gill function is extremely important to performance. And maybe even more so than we allot for, for lung function with humans, because the gill has a lot of really important roles. Um, gas exchange, so uptake of oxygen and removal of CO2, ion and acid base regulation, osmoregulation, removal of nitrogenous waste, and even immune function. So the gill also has a massive surface area, and this snapshot here is only a very small portion of one filament and the various lamellae on that one filament of one arch, and fish tend to have about three to four of these arches on either side underneath their opercula. And so with all of this surface area, you can imagine this is a critical interface between the external and internal environment of the fish. And therefore, we can really look at this as a key organ to understand stress and look maybe for a tissue damage under certain circumstances, looking for adaptive changes. And therefore, the gill can be a very valuable biomonitoring bio tool. It can be the first response to climate change stress. Unfortunately, most of the info that we've got from gill responses uh, to, has been in temperate species or from toxicology studies. I do want to talk about three examples um, that my research group has provided from coral reef fishes, um, just as a snapshot as to how we might be able to look at the gill uh, as an indicator of stress, climate change, and pollution, and that kind of thing. So example number one, ocean warming. We've had a lot of nice talks about what's happening in the near future with ocean warming. The gills respond to temperature. And as I mentioned, a lot of the research that has been done, especially in terms of temperature, has been on temperate species. And what has been found from these temperate species is that there is a very strong morphological change at the gill to increase surface area. Now these temperate species often experience greater than 20 degrees on a seasonal basis, on an annual basis, and so over their lifetime. So they're experiencing these great temperature ranges, and there's a strong need to add cells or remove cells to change the surface area of the gill appropriately. There really is a deficit in terms of tropical species. Until the study that I'm talking about now, there hadn't been any that had been done to understand this response in tropical species. So what we did is we went to the extreme. We went to um, a spot off Papua New Guinea, as close to the equator as we could find, because we wanted a really narrow temperature range. The fish populations here may be experiencing two to three degrees over their entire lifetime. We also wanted to incorporate a couple other temperatures to, to uh, allow for climate change as well. So we looked at some of the most common species found on the reefs up in, in Papua New Guinea, and we looked at their responses at the gill, looking for changes in surface area upon acclimation for a couple weeks to various temperatures that accommodated the range of temperatures that they're experiencing now, but also a couple other temperatures to include climate change predictions for the end of the century. And as you can see here in the four panel, we've got um, in the, the top, really bad at this as well, a top left-hand corner, 29 degree um, fish acclimated, um, and then 31 degree, and then on the bottom, 33 and 34. What you can really see is there really aren't any changes in gill structure. They aren't adding or removing cells to um, at increase or decrease surface area. What we did find that was really interesting is that per length of filament, they have a really high density of lamellae. Um, similar to what we see in extremely athletic fish species like tuna. So what we concluded is that they may not have enough room within the structure of the gill to do this remodeling that we understand from temperate species. And they might be doing some other mechanisms physiologically to increase surface area or increase use of the gill by increasing maybe perfusion. At the high end in some of these species, particularly the, the lemon damselfish, Upon acclimation to 34 degrees, complete gill damage, complete loss of surface area. 
And so that's really telling as to what kinds of responses, although maybe very limited, these uh, equatorial populations of fishes might have to respond at the level of the gill to future climate change predictions and temperature. And for more information about this particular study, this was done by a master's student, um, Alyssa Bowden, and it was published last month. Example number two, suspended sediment. There's an immune response at the gill, and John Brody gave a really nice um, introduction to suspended sediment and the causes um, and the sources of suspended sediment uh, this morning. We do know that about 80% of suspended sediment that's experienced on the reef is coming from anthropogenic sources. And this is a five and a half times increase since European settlement. This is a big problem for larval fish. Uh, their gills are developing at this time. They have an extremely high growth rate and metabolic rate. And from a really nice study by Amelia Wenger, we know that suspended sediment will delay development. Um, this is Amphiprion percula. What we also looked at is at the gill. So what is suspended sediment doing um, to the gill? So here we've got a control gill. We've got nice surface area, uh, lots of lamellae, fully extended. Then we exposed these developing uh, amphibrion percula to 45 milligrams per liter suspended sediment. And I'll mention that that's actually relatively low compared to what's expected to be on the reef under these certain circumstances. And what you can see here is a, a loss of surface area, a lot of mucus production. And that tends to be the first response. Um, mucus production um, can protect the infrastructure of the gill from the damage of the suspended sediment. And if that's not enough, the gill will start adding more cells, a hyperplasia response to really protect the integrity of the gill. And so the result of this is a 56% increase in diffusion distance. And so that means that it, from the oxygen that's in the water, there's a 56% increase in the distance that it takes for that oxygen to get inside the red blood cell. So this can have really dire implications for performance of these fish. Not only that, but we took core samples from these gills and did 16S DNA sequencing and found over 100 phylotypes of bacteria that were unique to suspended sediment fish. Um, and so what we're seeing is a shift from commensal to pathogenic bacteria, and therefore probably an increase in the potential for disease in these fish as well. So suspended sediment can impact gill function, performance, and fitness. And especially in these larval stages, this can have dire implications for recruitment, abundance, and diversity. So for my third and final example, I want to talk a bit about ocean acidification. I know Phil Monday is going to give some really nice information about this tomorrow. Um, and this is, this is very preliminary uh, work, uh, kind of a work in progress. Um, but what we're seeing is maybe the gills are trying to save energy during ocean acidification. As I mentioned earlier, the gill is also an important structure for ion and acid-base regulation. And as a snapshot of how important that is, this is a control gill, and the tool I use to image this gill is immunohistochemistry, and it's essentially an antigen-antibody reaction. And so the proteins, which in this case here are two different types of ion transporters, are seen as the antigen. And you expose the gill to specific antibodies that have fluorophores. And when they react, the fluorophore fluoresces, and that's what we see with the red and the green. So we've got sodium potassium ATPase, or NKA, which is a, an ATP-mediated um, uh, transporter. And that is co-localized right there at the base of each lamellae with a sodium proton exchanger. And that's a really important exchanger for acid extrusion. So, uh, Amphiprion melanopis was exposed to elevated CO2. And a couple interesting things came about. If this energy saving idea is in mind, they increased reproduction and increased development of juveniles. And this is some really nice work that was done by um, Gabrielle Miller over the last couple years. But there was a decrease in whole animal metabolic performance. What was really interesting is at those gills, they were really downregulating that extremely expensive um, ion transport system, so the NKA. And that was after 10 days exposure, but then after 18 months exposure as well. So it's an acute response, but it's also prolonged. Reducing NKA is a massive opportunity for metabolic savings. It can represent up to 25% of resting metabolism of an organism. 
What was really interesting is that they still maintained this crucial sodium proton exchanger that's acid extrusion, very important for, for when you're being exposed to high CO2, in a, about a 40% 40 40 ratio, which is what we found in con control fish. But they were decreasing that very expensive transporter, NKA. And so given Gabby's um, findings with uh, increase in reproduction and development, but also the decrease in whole organism metabolic performance, there clearly are some trade-offs here in terms of, of saving energy. So the take-home message, um, we have a really neat opportunity to look at the gills in tropical and coral reef fish species um, to understand what might be happening uh, from an adaptive level or from an acclimation level as well. Um, when fish are exposed to climate change and other anthropogenic stressors. So with that, I'd like to thank especially um, my colleagues who participated and, and were crucial to these three major studies, especially the first name on each of these lists because um, these three students did uh, most of the really hard work. So thank you. <laughs>